straight to quarters. Run out the gun. Stand by this tavern battery. One broadside into her, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Lynn stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. that affects the very soul of a naval officer. It brought back memories to me of an incident far earlier in my naval career when it had fallen me to deal with a traitor of a very different sort. At that time, I was a young lieutenant aboard HMS Renown, then part of the Channel Fleet. Admiral Lord Bridport, flying his flag in HMS Victory, had momentarily abandoned his watch over the French fleet, bottled up in the port of Brest, now his 19 ships of the line and seven frigates had rounded Berry Head and dropped anchor in the shelter of Tor Bay. Here comes Hart, the master's mate, to make his report, I suppose. Report? Yes. They put him as prize master aboard that French prize we snapped up in the channel yesterday. Well, he appears to have brought her safely to anchor. He doesn't seem to have relieved his anxiety. He's coming aboard as though the Admiral himself were waiting for him. Master's arms hot. Reporting, sir, from the prize Esperance. Important news for Captain Sawyer. Carry on, Hart. Aye, aye, sir. He seems excited. Perhaps the Esperance is full of gold. I'd give a ship full of gold for a drink of fresh water instead of the green slime we've been having this last month. We'll have to get some soon. The boats are put into Brixham and Torquay for supplies. Oh, good. No. Stand by. Here comes the captain in a hurry. And Hart with him. If it's trouble, I'm keeping out of it. Mr. Hornblower, sir, kindly send this signal. Aye, uh, sir. Mr. James. That's that confounded signal, Mr. Yes, sir. The message is to the Admiral himself, sir. It reads, renowned to flag. Prize is French national brig Esperance. Having on board Barry McCool. That is at once I shall wait on deck for an answer. Aye, aye, sir. It seemed a somewhat unimportant message for the captain to supervise personally. The name of Barry McCool meant nothing to me. But the captain's eagerness was such that I lost no time in reeling off the flag numbers to Mr. James. The signal went soaring up to the yard arm, the halyards vibrating wildly in the gale. Sir, reply coming from the victory. Yes, 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 yes. What does it say? Here it comes, sir. Flag to renown. Is McCool alive? Reply affirmative, Mr. Hornblower. Have him on board at once. Court martial will assemble. Ah. Mr. Hart. All right, sir. Bring your prisoner aboard, Hart. But keep his hands bound. Have him hoisted in. All right, sir. I could not forbear to steal a glance at the prisoner as he was hauled aboard with his sea chest after him. 
a youngish man, tall and slender, his long red hair streaming in the wind. Although he was obviously an Irishman, he wore a French infantry uniform. Yet why should we try him instead of the civil authorities? It was not until two bells in the middle watch when dinner was served in the gun room that I had an explanation. The cool deserted one dark night off the Penmark. He got through a lower gun port with a grating to float him. Ah, we gave him up for drown till news came from Paris that he was there and up to his old speechifying. He even boasted about deserting. Another wolf tone, in fact. Tone was caught in a French uniform, and he'd have been stung up if he hadn't managed to cut his own throat first. Now, come to Senate Buckland. We may hear some news. Uh, from the look of him, it'll be unpleasant. A dirty job for somebody, I'll warrant. It'll be a junior lieutenant. It'll be me if it's anyone. I'm the most junior. Uh, Mr. Hornblower, sir, I'm going to make you responsible for the prisoner. Sir, McCool must be brought up for trial safe and sound, and kept safe after the trial. I'm repeating the captain's own words, Mr. Hornblower. Used it, I might well have dangled at the yard arm with McCool. I quitted the table with a hurried bow and made my way to the darkness of the lower tween decks. The master of arms, who was my guide, ordered aside the marine sentry who guarded a small door, shone the light of his candle lantern on the door, and produced a key. Easy as it, safe and sound. I put him in his empty storeroom and a couple of my corporals along with him. I've been put in charge of you. That is most gratifying to me, Mr... Uh, Mr... Hornblower. Um, is there anything you need? I could eat and I could drink. Nothing has passed my lips since 24 hours ago when the Esperance was captured. Food and water, Master Adant. And immediately. Aye, right, sir. I'll see to it right away. Uh, anything else? A mattress, perhaps, sir. Or a cushion. Uh, you will observe that this chest upon which I sit has my name carved on its lid in raised letters. I bear an honored name, but I do not desire it imprinted on my person. Hmm. Yes, I'll, I'll send you in a mattress. Ah, that gun means the court martial is about to open, I presume. But do we go? We do. Then I can leave this delicious food without any breach of good manners. <laughs> Court-martial. Gold lace and curt, efficient routine. Evidence of identification. Cold questions. Nothing I could say would be listened to amid these emblems of tyranny. Right from the start, it was evident from McCool's demeanor what the result of the court-martial would be. The sentence of this court is that you, Barry Ignatius McCool, be hanged by the neck. Oh, Lord, sir. Yes, what is it? Captain's compliments, and he'd like to speak to you. Rear Admiral, the Honorable Sir William Cornwallis is with him, sir. Now, looky here, young sir. You're the officer charged with carrying out his execution, I'm told. Yes, sir. Oh, when he's strung up, there's to be no speechifying. That's right, any Captain Sawyer? Yes, sir. Yes, but I thought, sir, that... Yes, uh, I know all about the old custom of letting him make a last speech. But a quarter of the hands of this ship are Irish. And I'd as lief have a light take with a magazine. Does that McCool make a speech to him? I understand, sir. All right. Stream up. Ah. Here comes Jack Ketch. McCool, um, tomorrow... Tomorrow? Uh, yes. Tomorrow, you are to make no speeches. No. No farewell to my country. No. 
You are robbing a condemned man of his last breath. I'm carrying out my orders. And you propose to enforce them? Yes. And may I ask how? Well, I, 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 I could stop your mouth with oakum. <laughs> Mr. Hornblower, you do not relish your own suggestion. I suspect you are not the ideal executioner. Supposing I were to save you that trouble. How would you do that? I could give you my parole to say nothing. Oh, you, you don't have to trust the word of a condemned fanatic. We can strike a bargain. And you needn't carry out your half unless I have carried out mine. So what bargain? Allow me to write to my wife, my widow. Promise to send the letter and my sea chest to her in Dublin. You'll have small trouble to find a coaster bone there. And, and you know the chest contains nothing but clothes and things of sentimental value. Yes, I know. In return, I promise to say nothing. From the time I leave this place until... until well... You can read the letter. There'll be no treason. If I understand you, Mr. Hornblower, you're a gentleman of sensibility. You will dislike prizing a man's mouth open and selling it for the toe. By this means, you need not. Well, I'll... Uh, I'll send pen, ink and paper, and... Um, I shall read the letter before I agree, of course. You can see I had trouble wooing the mules, but there is my fair copy. A convert. You need have no scruples in reading it. Um, well, what is this poem, Mufus? A thing she'll look for, Mr. Hornblower, oh? and without which you will not believe the letter is from me. My poems were ever a bond between us. I see. It made but little sense to me. The, the poem seemed turgid and ponderous, though I'm... I was no judge in such matters. Yet I thought, if I were condemned to die within a few hours, could I write a single line that would make sense? Would you accept my word now and keep our bargain? Very well, McCool. I accept. for all hands to witness punishment, and all hands assembled. As we came on deck, a, a murmur rose from the assembled men. Around the ship lay boats from all the rest of the fleet, boats filled with men sent to witness the punishment, but also ready to storm the renown should any of the crew attempt to demonstrate in sympathy with their countrymen. I only recall those next few moments as a ghastly nightmare, a chalk ring on the gangway, and McCool standing silently on it, pale but with head high. Signal gun ready. Fire! Beating about in a ship of the line on the dreary work of blockade gave me little to do that would distract my mind from its obsession with a picture of red hair and a lopsided smile. But spring approached at last, thank heaven, and the weather began to moderate. One day I sat alone in my tiny cabin while the timbers creaked soothingly around me as the renown pitched over the long Atlantic swell. I was thinking again of that letter, still in my letter case, and the poem, which I now knew by heart. And then I ceased to lounge on my cot and sat up straight. An incredible idea had entered my mind. So strike them down. Now, why did McCool write E-M instead of T-H-E-M? For, for euphony or rhythm? So strike them down. And, well, if anything, it sounds better than so strike them down. Could it possibly be a code? Drag the chest out. With its solid slabs of mahogany and its raised name, it was a handsome piece of furniture. And then... A sudden light blazed into my mind. The carved name 
B. I. McCool. The B. S. N. The B. Those initials are B. I. And as I took hold of the lid again and lifted it, the secret of McCool was revealed. Only half the lid rose. The lower half stayed where it was. And in the oblong hollow between them lay a mass of papers neatly packaged. Banknotes! Five pound notes! And in this package, too. Yes, ample money here to finance the beginning of a new rebellion. What's this, huh? More money? No. No, lists. Lists of names. And information about each name. Mm. Mm -hmm. Every requisite for starting a new plot. What's this? A a proclamation. Irishman Smith is coming. When Smith had gone, I set myself to study the ingenious mechanism of the secret log. Unless every operation were gone through in its proper order, nothing happened. The I would not turn unless the B were first pulled out, and it was most unlikely that a casual investigator would pull at the B with enough force. Altogether, it was fairly safe to say that without a clue, nobody could have opened the chest to discover its secret. But though I temporized by playing with the chest, I knew that a great and grave decision faced me. A decision which eluded me through many a lonely watch. Keep off a point, you at the wheel. Pull them by. Pull them by, it is, sir. Whatever the man was, he was brave. I am faithful. Faithful unto death. His last thought was of the cause he died for. Heavens, if that wind had stayed westerly for a few more hours, that chest might have been on its way to Dublin, and then... But now, if I deliver up the chest to the captain, pain will be ruined, every gallery in Ireland will be cluttered. What about the money? Yes, that, that might be useful, but... No, I, sh- I should never rest. Rest? What rest I get now? sleepless nights, my mind was made up. It was evening. Mine was the first watch. Darkness had closed over the Bay of Biscay, and the Renan, under easy sail, was loitering along over the black water, with her consort just in sight. Hawkins, sir? Oh, sit down to my cabin and see if Mr. Smith's there, will you? Oh, beg your pardon, sir, but uh, Mr. Smith's playing cards in the gun room. Uh, I've seen him myself, sir. Oh, oh, well, no matter. Um... Send Crookshank and Bottle after me. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, <clears throat> if, you'll, if you'll pardon me, sir, if it's a job you want done, uh, maybe I could do it. Huh? Then to eat much more than idiot, sir, as I know to my cost. Oh, sir, when I require a speech, I'll ask for it. You heard my order? Aye, aye sir. Beg your pardon, sir. Idiots. Well, why else does he think I chose those two of all my watch? They at least will have no curiosity. Oh, uh, Crookshank, Bottle, I... Uh, I want you to go down to my cabin, you know the one. Uh, and there you'll find a large, heavy, canvas-covered box. Uh, bring it up and place it in the scuppers. Uh, it, it's heavy, so take care. All right. I waited in a fever of anxiety lest a fool should drop it or, or stumble across an officer who might ask questions. The chest was indeed heavy, for I'd buried among the clothing two 24-pound shot. But at last, after what seemed an age... Thank you, man. Well, back to your station, huh? Next ten minutes were a thousand years, but at last... Hands for taxi! Prepare the track! And as the renown tacked, with one tremendous heave and unobserved, I managed to throw the thing overboard. <laughs> A 
on what might. My decision was made and carried out. There could be no more vacillation. And when eight bells struck, I went below and slept soundly. For the first time for weeks, I had no dreams of red hair and lopsided smiles. <laughs> Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.